Hello, hello, hello. It is me, Uncle Tickles, and this is New Dad. I'm really excited for today's episode. Really excited for you guys to hear the interview with the guest. Uh, it's one of my favorites I've done uh, in uh, over the course of the two seasons. Uh, but before we get into that, this is a reminder to make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. If you're a listener, rate and review. Uh, check us out on Patreon. We're over there, and well, you know we're starting to make some bucks, some dollar bucks, as Chef would say. Um, so uh, probably a good time to thank our patrons. Uh, we have Aziz and Ashe over at History of Westeros and Laura Brandos over at Ohio. New Dad thanks you. Also a good time to uh, wish all the dads out there a happy early Father's Day. Uh, you might notice if you watch that I'm wearing my Cubs hat, but in the interview I'm wearing my dude hat. I switched over because... Lita and I are taking the boys over to Wrigley Field uh, tomorrow, which is Friday, um, for Shep and Solo's first game. So head over to the Instagram page. You might be able to catch a couple pics uh, of us at the field. Uh, I'm sure Lita will have the boys looking real cute. And, um, you know, Wrigley Field is one of the most beautiful places on earth. So um, certainly be some good photos coming your way. Um, And also a good time to plug that Instagram page. Um, Some of those formalities out of the way. Let's talk about this guest that I'm so excited about. He's a father, an author, hockey fan, and teacher, uh, Keith Gesson. Uh, He has uh, put out two novels um, before his most recent book, which is the one we're going to talk a lot about, Raising Rafi. He covers the first five years of his oldest son's life. Um, I think you'd be able to tell throughout the interview. I, I genuinely love this book. Haven't loved a lot of the parenting books I've read. Um, took a lot of the things I felt or, or struggled to put into words as a dad and laid them out quite beautifully and honestly in a way that, uh, you know, kept having me say, uh, like, yes, yes, I, I, I fucking relate to that, um, you know, or, or that's something that's ex- that's happened to me before. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned that quite a bit throughout this interview. Uh, he was uh, a, a great, a, a great interview and very gracious with his time. Uh, Keith, if you're listening, I hope you're happy with how it turned out uh, and would hopefully consider coming back sometime. There's a lot we didn't get to discuss and, uh, and a lot more I'd like to kind of dig a little bit more deeper into. And uh, with that being said, I think it's important uh, to note before Prop Cause whisks us away with that amazing theme song of his, uh, that, you know, we are all, and by we all, I mean dads like Keith and me who write or drone endlessly on a shitty podcast um, about parenting, um, you know, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants. And those giants are moms who blogged or wrote about uh parenting for the last hundred years or so so shout out to all the moms out there happy father's day to all the dads thank you to keith and all the tickle monsters uh pop cause you know what to do is Uncle Tickles here, and you have a new episode of New Dad coming at you. Uh, really excited for today's guest, as we've been uh, promoting uh, earlier in the week. We have Keith Gesson here, the author of Raising Raffi. Um, Keith, really excited to get you on. I had come across your book in an article by The Atlantic, um, snatched it up, started listening to it, and was just shocked by how, how much it resonated with me and how much I found in common with your experience. So thanks for coming on. Uh, Tell our audience and all the little tickle monsters out there uh, a little bit more about yourself. Uh, Sure. Um, Thanks for, thanks for having me. This is very exciting for me. Um, I, uh, let's see, I was, I was, uh, I was born in Russia, um, came over to the U S when I was little um, in the early eighties and uh, grew up outside of Boston. Um, uh, 
what else? Now I, um, I moved to New York uh, a little bit after college and I've uh, been a freelance writer for most of, uh, basically most of my life after college. Uh, a few years ago, I started teaching uh, journalism um, full time as a kind of steady job. Um, uh, actually, after after uh, Rafi was born, <laughs> I realized I needed a job uh, that was a little um, steadier than uh, than freelance writing. But I've, I've continued writing. Um, I guess I've published uh, two novels, and this is my first book of uh, nonfiction. You're here because you you, know, you are a father, uh, most importantly, um, father of two. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your your two boys. Uh, yeah, uh, so so Rafi, about whom uh, or, or who's the kind of the occasion for for the book, um, he's uh, he's now seven. He just turned seven. He's a rambunctious guy. Uh, although <laughs> although uh, you know, in the last uh, year, he's really kind of um, chilled out quite a bit. And and uh, actually, in the last couple of months, he learned how to read. So oh, wow. that's been a real that's been a real <laughs> revelation. I mean, he just kind of can sit there on the couch and, and read. Um, which uh, has been very nice. Um, and his brother, Ilya, is about to turn four. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was really challenging when, when Ilya was an infant and, and Rafi was three. That was the really, that was a tough year. Um, <laughs> but now, um, you know, it's getting a little easier. Uh, they still, you know, they still fight a lot. Uh, Ilya's a little bigger now, so he can kind of fend for himself a, a lot better than he used to be able to. Um, so that's nice too. Do you notice a lot of like similarities or, or dissimilarities between the two? And, and oh, they're they are so different. Um, yeah. I mean, they uh, they look different. Rafi looks a lot like me. Um, he looks a lot like his mother. Um, but also, they just uh, you know, Elias, Elias now he's kind of in a in a in a phase of a kind of rebellious phase. But he's been <laughs> just a very easygoing, um, just a just very easygoing I mean, he's the second kid so like he's got less attention and um and, and we've been less obsessed uh, right. uh um you know over everything to do with him but i think just he was just born kind of quieter and and, and um more self-sufficient and um and they both you know it, it, it is it is amazing how different they are it's it's shocking now before you had your second child what were your you know, your, I guess your thoughts, did you think they would be very similar? Um, were you thinking that they would be dissimilar? Uh, it, are you surprised? Because I found myself, the reason I have, you, our, our, uh, our listeners know I have two sons, right? Uh, my oldest is about your youngest's age. And, uh, and then I have a, a two-year-old. And they, as, as you say, they're just total opposites. And I, I was surprised by how polar opposite they were. I mean, and now as they're starting to get older, they're playing together, you see more similarities, but they're still very, very different people. Um, one is much more apt to allow help. The other one is independent, wants to do everything. Um, and it's the the second born. And I think much to your point, you know, he's received much less attention from us. And, uh, you know, just as a result, uh, kind of a little tougher, uh, you know, all around the edges. Um, yeah. yeah. How do I, yeah. were you surprised? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I mean, some of it is clearly like structural in the sense of you're just, you know, if you have one kid who, who, who needs a lot of attention, that's just how he, that's just how he rolls. Right. And, um, the other kid is just, there's just not gonna be enough attention. You know, there's not gonna be attention left over him. He's going to have to go and play by himself and he's going to do that. And I mean, one of the things, you know, and, um, as, as Ilya has become a bit more, of a troublemaker, um, Rafi has become uh, less of a troublemaker, <laughs> and I don't think I don't think it's an accident. I think the kid, I think they kind of know when you're not know, but like they kind of they kind of fill that space, right? <laughs> and so when Rafi was having you know a lot of trouble, um, you know, especially kind of early in the pandemic when we were doing we we're trying to do Zoom school, and um, he was you know he was four when the pandemic began, and four and a half and that was really tough um and it just kind of hung back <laughs> and it was like you know Rafi's going through some 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 things and I'm gonna let him do that and I'll, I'll be over here you know putting things in my mouth um <laughs> and 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 then you know and now as as Rafi's become a bit more uh relaxed and kind of is, is reading in on the couch Ilya will kind of fills that space so it's never um 
uh, it's never a kind of peaceful, uh, <laughs> <idea>. <laughs> but, and, you know, but it's also usually only one of them really um, acting up at a time. It's nice. Well, that's nice. <laughs> that's yeah. a nice reprieve, you, I guess you kind of get. Um, do, you, do you notice Rafi going into more of like a, a parenting role uh, as, as Aaliyah is starting to act out more? Yeah, I mean, he can, you know, he, he can be very, um, <laughs> he can be very helpful. Um, sometimes, you know, he's like, Ilya, if you don't stop doing, you know, you, you kind of see your own parenting reflected yeah. <laughs> in a kind of, you know, and it's not very uh, um, flattering. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, Ilya, if, if you don't stop doing that, you can't watch TV for the rest of your life. <laughs> and you're like, okay. Uh, you know where he gets that. that. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly where he gets that. I'm like, you don't have the authority to do that. Hey, right. we yeah. didn't deputize you. B, um, you know, rest of your life, like that's just, you don't escalate to that right away. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, you gotta, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some steps you gotta go through, but, you know, we, we have a procedure, Rafi. Yeah, and, and that um, seems to be, you know, something that, that comes up in the book quite a bit is how Rafi is a reflection of your own parenting. And at times, uh, yeah. you know, I've been taken aback myself by just the honesty and the uh, astuteness of, of kids. Um, you, you know, one of the anecdotes is, uh, you know, you, you mentioned when he says, you know, Dada superheroes don't get mad or Dada, I love you even when you do bad things to me. And, uh, and, and you know, I've had those moments with, you know, with my own son, you know, Shep, where he's, you know, Dada, you're not being nice, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah. he's right. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not being very nice right now and, and it really kind of cuts you down a level you know or, or takes you down and, and humbles you um, um yeah i mean that's from the chapter i mean that's I, you know to me that's kind of the key chapter is it, it is about anger and for and, sure and just kind of what it's like when you get mad and yes at your little your little treasure <laughs> you know yeah. you love so much and uh, but he's just uh, and this this is you know that the, you know i still get mad but like the year that I got the most bad was when Ilya was helpless infant and Rafi was a kind of three-year-old, like really at his mm -hmm. most um, aggressive and aggressive. Yeah. And always trying to trying out new wrestling moves on. Yeah. So, not aware of his own strength, not aware of his yeah, capabilities. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, and, and, and also you talk about, there's like a knowing uh, disobedience that's different than earlier. Right. Yes, I think yeah. At around you know, at around you know, two they're just you, they're just little animals, and then at three they, they you know sometimes they have this look <laughs> on his face like I I know I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen if I do this, right? And um, makes it worse, right? You get it, you get it. You, you you're like not only is this a terrible, painful, annoying, but like you know it, you know um, that I don't want you to do this, and you're still doing it. Um, after all I've done for you. <laughs> right. So, yeah, and that was the sort of thing that, like, um, you know, that essay got published uh, in the New Yorker, I guess, uh, I don't know, two years ago. I mean, that, and it was, it was the sort of thing where I was like, as I was writing, and I was like, I have not seen this described, you know, especially right. not from, like, a, a male perspective. I've seen it in some uh, books about being a mother, but, but but not um, from the father's perspective. And I thought that was, you know, it was so, it was such a big part of my experience. And it's yeah. such a big part of the experience of other dads that I talked to is this like, is, are these moments of anger? And when you end up, you know, like, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I described two instances of hitting, which mm -hmm. I just want to clarify were like pretty mild, right? It, you know, it was like- Correct. I slapped him on the wrist. Like that was the, the most right. conscious um, kind of putting hands on Rafi was like, he was really messing with his brother in a way that I thought was dangerous, wouldn't stop. And I slapped him on the wrist. Um, so it was like a literal, a literal, a literal slap on the wrist. But like, right. there've been other times where I like would grab him, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I think everybody does that. Like, and you're like, and but grab him like roughly, you know, in a way yeah. that was not I ideal. <laughs> right. And yeah. And when I get together with the other dads, we kind of talk about this and like, it's uh, it's not great. You use the term in a different context, but it's like as a parent, you want some justice, you know. So it's like, <laughs> yes, yes. so you can't hit your kid, but you can lift him up very abruptly and aggressively, mm -hmm. so he knows you mean business. 
Um, and, and then there's that uh, immediate guilt that sets in afterwards, right? That a, a lot of us deal with and, 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 and you talk about honestly and, uh, and in a relatable way in the book too. But yeah, just to go back to what you, you, know, you, what you began with, I mean, I, I think those, those, those things that he said were very, when I heard them and, and um, uh, when, yeah, we would say, you're not a nice data, <laughs> you know? And I'd be like, oh my God, he's right. I'm not a nice data really failing. And then Ilya turned three, um, had, you know, again, so much, we had such an easier time with him. And suddenly yeah. he starts saying like the same stuff that yeah. I don't like you, you're not nice. And I was like, oh, this is just stuff they say. Right. <laughs> I was taking it way too personally. I was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it really is. You take it a lot less personally the second time around. And, and I mean, it, and you do become a better parent in that way. You're like, oh, this is just, you know, and it's going to pass. He's going to stop saying stuff like this. And, you know, he's, and he's going to stop acting like this. And, but the first time, you know, the first time you go through it, it's really tough. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, uh, you know, you mentioned in the book that, you know, there's a, there's a period, right. You are basically spending a lot more time with Rafi because mm -hmm. your wife mm -hmm. is, keeping this, the, the newborn alive. And so, yeah. you know, it, in during this time, there's, as you spend more time, there's just more, I guess, uh, more opportunity for conflict, right? And, mm -hmm. and not only that, but then Rafi is missing his mother and wants his mom, you know? And so yeah. th that's something I relate to very much, you know, because uh, when the pandemic happened, uh, my job became obsolete. I was in uh, large events and trade shows. So I became a stay-at-home dad. Um, mm -hmm. my, my wife works in the house. She's actually <laughs> sitting right next to me right here. Um, she's still working from home. And, uh, and so, you know, we're in a home, in home much, much larger than a, a 900 square foot apartment that you guys were in during the pandemic. But, um, um, and, and, and you, you, you guys were able to get a little more space, but as you said, that doesn't necessarily fix things. You know, they don't, they know their mother's upstairs. And when I have to become the disciplinarian, what they want is their mother and they're missing their mom and they know she's there. So uh, it sounded like a very similar relatable thing. Here you are with Rafi. He knows mom's just in the room next door. Um, and, and your job essentially is to keep them away from each other. <laughs> you know? and, and yeah, I mean, that, that, like, I got so many of our conflicts um, around that age were like, I was like the, you know, bodyguard or whatever for like the door <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to mommy and, and um, mama, he calls her. And, yeah. and yeah, that, I mean, it's just a particularly kind of, uh, psychologically taxing <laughs> yeah, task, right? Sure. It's not just like, don't touch that, don't touch that hot oven. It's like, you can't go to mommy and I'm the one who's going to prevent you, right? And like, he yeah. already thinks I'm the, <laughs> I'm the one who's, you know, kind of uh, restricting access to mama. And yeah. but now I'm like literally doing this. And yeah, it's, that was horrible. But and, and I have to give you credit because, um, you know, you do something that I think a lot of, of fathers and parents in general don't do when uh, when you hit a point where you're you know kind of out of you know your own depth as a parent and you didn't know what to do and you found yourself questioning you know am I a good dad or you know he's right I'm not you went to the experts and you read books and you read a lot of books it sounds like on parenting and behaviorism um, and, and I found some of your insight on those you know illuminating because these are things that you know we're currently going through with our kids. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, it, the amount of parenting information there is out there and how conflicting it can all be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, and mm -hmm. th you don't necessarily, uh, um, you, you know, address that uh, idea, but I think it's very, it, it's, it's there, it's a thread throughout the book, right? Yeah. I mean, somebody, somebody asked me the other day whether I was reading these books, um, because I knew I was writing my own book and I wanted to write about them. And I was like, no, 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 I was, des I was desperate. You know, I really mm -hmm. was trying to get some, some handle on the situation and try to figure out like, what can I do? And, and, you know, and the thing is like, I end up uh, being somewhat critical of all these books, not, not all of them, but a lot of them, because they, you know, they do have these, they, each of them kind of presents a solution. They're like, right. this is the solution to your problem. And and I found in every case, very, I found myself very earnestly um, 
you know, being like, I'm going to use this solution <laughs> and <laughs> right. it's going to solve my problem. It says so in the book and it mm -hmm. describes these cases that are a lot like mine, you know, and then you find yourself, I mean, the, the kind of um, realization I came to later was, well, I'll just go through it in order. I, yeah. I found myself, you know, I would do some of these things and they didn't work, right? Or I would try to, you know, I would do them one day and then I would forget to do them the next day. So <laughs> consistent, right? Um, or I just found I just couldn't do it. I just like, yeah. you know, the, the, the books that I found most appealing, you know, there's this kind of lineage of books, but the most famous, um, at least uh, as far as I can tell, the most, you know, it's uh, How to Talk So Your Kids Will Listen, How to Listen So Your Kids Will Talk. Mm -hmm. um, it's a book from the 80s and there's been various kind of iterations of that idea uh, before and after, but it's, you know, it's like being empathetic, like mirroring, um, and that stuff does work. And I have employed it occasionally with success, um, not with Rafi, but with his brother, <laughs> right? <laughs> it kind of just didn't work with Rafi. Like he just kind of saw right through it. Um, you know, he's like, you're not making my problem going away, but just by repeating what I said, or just by like, acknowledge you know, I have this problem. I don't, you acknowledging the problem isn't helping you know, right. I still want to see mama, right? Yeah. You're still not letting me into the bedroom. Um, exactly. And, you know, and, but also I just found I wasn't that, I just couldn't do it on a consistent yeah. basis. Uh, I couldn't listen, you know, I like, I just, I had that. And, and, <laughs> you know, and the other, the other kind of approach, the behaviorist approach where you just ignore stuff, mm -hmm. you know, I also found very appealing. I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I just be like the stoic. Right. who, you know, no matter what my kid does, I'll be like, mm -hmm. yep, you just did that. <laughs> and it's fine. And like, I, I couldn't do that either. Right? right. And I would, and I would feel very disappointed. You know, I'd be like, ah, like, why can't I do it? Um, yeah. And, you know, at the end, I like come to this realization that it's just like, I'm, I'm me. And there, you know, I can read all the books I want, but I'm going to like, basically remain myself. And the task before me is to be the kind of best version of that self, right? Without trying to, you know, just turn into a completely different person. Yeah. And, and that was a, a kind of wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I imagine it's somewhat yeah. freeing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it was, yeah, it, I was like, okay, this is me. I like, I yell, I, I, uh, I should yell less, but like at a certain point I'm going to yell. And like the kids, they know that you know, and, yeah. and they can kind of, they can work with that, right? Like they, they I'm, I'm predictable. They, you know, by the way, it's not like, oh no, dad is yelling. We, <laughs> we must stop what we're doing. I like just last night they were being, they were both being like, they were like hitting each other and then they were hitting <laughs> me. And I was, I started yelling. It didn't help at all. You know, right. so, it's, <laughs> so as like a tyrant uh, of our household, I'm not a very effective one, but like, <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I just got like, yeah, I'm like, all right, I, I, my dad, you know, and then, and, and this is in the last chapter called bear dad, where like, mm -hmm. I think about how I was raised and my dad, um, you know, hardly a kind of authoritarian or tyrannical, but he was this kind of uh, guy who grew up in the Soviet Union. Um, you know, not a big talker, um, you know, and a bit of a, you know, and he could raise his voice. Huh? Uh, and like, that's how I grew up. And I, I, I love the guy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm not him. And like, um, we're different, but that's, that's kind of how I think that should kind of be, you know, or like, yeah. that's okay for us to be a little bit that way, uh, both right. in reason. So, yeah, coming, I, it, it comes, there's this, uh, as you know, there's this epiphany at the playground where yeah. <laughs> I see a dad who's, who's like so empathetic and so mirroring and, and just like his daughter refuses to leave the playground and it takes them an inordinate amount of time to leave the playground. <laughs> and I am like, and I've just, and I've just read this book about cross-cultural parenting, which is, you know, looks at the different ways parents, you know, do yes. things in different, in different places. The argument of that book, you know, you have these books that are, that are like, oh, they, in France, they parent better. Or, you know, the Tiger Mom book, you know, Chinese parents are the are the, yeah. the best parents, right? And, and every right. few years, there's one of these books, German parents, Dutch parents, yeah. um, uh, you know, Mayan parents, right? <laughs> Ancient Maya culture. And, and, all, and they, all, they all make you feel bad. 
Right. Um, you're like, ah, why can't I parent like a French person? And actually, and the answer is because you don't have free childcare, like they, like free high quality childcare. You know, your grandparents don't live down the street or in or on their like French estate, you know, outside of Paris that you can drop your kids <laughs> uh, with them for two weeks. Like, there's just all these like structural facts of life. Yeah. Um, and and that's the argument of that book. That that book says you know, it looks at all these countries, different parenting practices. And, and it, it's, it says, look, these, they're not better or worse. They are embedded in the histories and cultures of those places. And you can't just recreate them, you know, yeah. in Brooklyn, New York or wherever, you know, and, um, and that was very helpful. I'm like, okay, I am a Russian guy, <laughs> you know, who grew up in the U.S., who grew up outside of Boston, I like hockey, um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's, and I live in Brooklyn, New York, you know, in 2000 now, in 2022, and like, right. that's, that's my situation, and yeah. um, I need to work with that particular situation. And I, I think that's kind of a great outlook, and that's something that any parent can, can take and probably adapt and put it in, and operate in their life. Um so. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, I really do. I think I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not so uh, naive to think that, uh, like, hey, this book just appeals to me because I'm, I imagine you hope it appeals to a ton of people, right? <laughs> a, a lot of people to buy it, but it, it was, it was striking how much of, uh, of what I was reading, I either thought like I could relate to, um, or was just something I can apply, or this is this is not, not a eureka moment, but finally something that sounds more like uh, something I can wrap my head around. Because as you're saying, mm -hmm. some of the stuff just, it seems like it, you're set up to fail. Uh, if you're trying to recreate, like you said, 1928 Paris, France and a parenting situation like that, you, you just can't do it. And, uh, and like you said, current day, insert your city now. Um, yeah. you, you talk quite a bit in the book about, you know, you grew up or you were, I guess you came here when you were six, right? from Russia. So you, you spent your early childhood in Russia. Um, and, and I found it interesting how, you know, as a kid, uh, that, uh, that connection to Russia kind of ebbs and flows, right? Uh, it seems like there was a point where, you, you, you know, you, you go the Americanized route, um, and then your mother passes away. And I think that was a catalyst to feel connected to the Russian roots again. Uh, is that fair to say? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, I, I I was kind of um, you know, when you're especially when you're uh, so little, when it, like it, the the cutoff point for for having an accent, mm -hmm. um, if you're Russian, and it kind of depends on the language, but it, Russian it's like eight or nine, you know, and after that, you just if you if you came after that, you're just gonna have an accent, mm -hmm. and and everybody will always kind of and it will always mark you off a little bit, but when you're under that age, um, you won't. So you can really just kind of like slide right in and <laughs> um, and assimilate, you know, and that was certainly, I certainly took that to be our mission when we came here, right? We left the Soviet Union. We didn't like it there. <laughs> right. Uh, we had no, we had no plans to go back. So um, yeah, I very much thought, okay, we're going to assimilate and I am the best positioned person in my family to do that because I was the littlest. Um, I had no accent. I had no... Mm -hmm kind of no baggage um and you know on the other hand right uh my parents you know they they hated they kind of hated russia but they loved russian culture and the russian right. language and they really did want me to to know russian and they made sure i had russian lessons and and my mom in particular she was a literary critic and she was kind of the person in our family who who really kind of kept us um, tethered to Russian culture in all these ways. Um, and, you know, and all my parents' friends were Russian. So right. we were in this like Russian kind of island, you know, inside the U.S., right? Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and when she, and I, she died when I was uh, 17, when I was, in, when I was in high school. So, so that was a kind of moment where I really had to decide like, okay, if I don't make a conscious effort um, to sort of stay in touch with this culture, I, it will it will dis, it will dissipate, you know, yeah. because there this person who who was doing the work um, is gone, and and then I started college, and 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 that was I was like, okay, uh, maybe I'll study Russian for a little bit, you know, and then mm -hmm. that, you know, and and so so when I was talking earlier about being a freelance writer, a lot of that work has been 
in Russia or about Russia. Um, I've spent a lot of time there. I've traveled there a lot. Um, you just re- came back from Ukraine recently, right? I did. Yeah, I was there a few in uh, March. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually my second book, A Terrible Country, is about um, kind of a, um, a fictionalized account of a year that I spent with my grandmother um, in Moscow in um, 2008. Um, so yeah, so I've written a ton about Russia. I'm really, it's meant a, a great deal to me um, to have that connection and to have kept it up. And then when you know, this is this is kind of one of these interesting questions that you are faced with as a parent. Um, mm-hmm. You have to decide. You're like, okay, what about the things that I do and like to do, or that have been important to me? Um, am I going to try to pass on to my kid? Because they don't, you know, some things are just gonna like <laughs> the stuff we talked about. That's kind of like very kind of <laughs> hard to eradicate, like the you know, like, like the yelling or the kind of yeah. you know, my, my kind of. <laughs> slightly Russian ideas about discipline and like doing your homework, for example. Um, Those are, those are going to, you're going to pass those on whether you like it or not. But, um, you know, other things like, so the, so the the kind of two things um, that have meant a ton to me in my life are are Russian and and hockey, as I mentioned earlier. And um, I have found both of them to be a real challenge. Um, You know, hockey is a, is a game that's not, played a lot in New York you have to really go out of your way um to to find you know to find ice time and Mm -hmm. then Russian um you know my wife is not Russian Um, (laughs) and we we actually you know there's a ton of Russians in Brooklyn but they're in a different part of Brooklyn (laughs) so where we live you know and so um and then I had these you know I had these kind of mixed feelings about it in the same sort of in the same way that my parents did but but more um I guess a more uh, dangerously or for, for, you know, for my connection to Russia, because it's like, okay, like my parents couldn't help being Russian. And, they, right. and for them speaking Russian to me was just obvious because, uh, you know, we'd always spoken Russian and, um, you know, they didn't see any reason to change that once we came here and they were much right. more comfortable in Russian than they were in English. Whereas I am more comfortable in English. Um, so kind of deciding to speak Russian to Rappi was a very deliberate choice. And I kind of, you know, made it, you know, I just kind of thought it would be interesting to start when he was little. And then once I started and I found that he was like understanding me, um, (laughs) then I was like, oh, I'm teaching him Russian. And then I was like, okay, what's that going to lead to? Like, is he actually going to go to Russia? Like, is that something I want? (laughs) (laughs) You know, and this is, I, you know, this was a few years ago. Right. Um, um, but it's gotten, obviously it's gotten even worse right, um, right. since February 24th. I mean, we were, you know, the way to, you know, one of the things that I talk about in that chapter is I found this amazing um, book from the 1940s by this German linguist who, um, it's this, uh, it turned out to be this real classic account of bilingualism, but he was, he was a German linguist who emigrated to the U.S., married a, um, an American woman, and then they had a daughter, Hildegard, and he's like, I'm going to teach her German. And even though my wife doesn't know German. So, and it's, and he kept this painstaking diary, um, which he then, because he was a linguist, like analyzed, um, you know, for, and, you know, for the first two years of her life. And it was just, you know, some of it's very technical. He he (laughs) describes the opening um, paragraph of the book is this incredible paragraph where he does like linguistic notation for infant you know screaming <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and um but then you know then she starts you know learning language and you know some words she learns in english some words she learns in german he's very frustrated like when his friends come over she answers them in english even though they they're german speakers they switch over to english right. he's very frustrated i have the same experience right. when i you know when my family interacts you know they're russian speakers but they, of course they also speak english uh when they interact with rafi he answers them in english so they switch over to english and i'm like no 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 yeah, yeah. you gotta speak, <laughs> keep speaking russian to him so yeah. um anyway so i found that book and it was so interesting um but this you know ultimately um in that book the kind of joke or it's kind of a dark joke but like he he has all these struggles um they live in i think they live in chicago um you know he has all these struggles te- teaching her german then um they go they finally go to germany for a summer mm-hmm. in 1935 
and so it's Nazi Germany. Yeah. And um, you know, and he's he's no Nazi, and he like he's kind of freaked out by the whole situation. But but you know, his dad is there, and his sister's there. And he leaves, um, and he has to go work. He and his wife are going on this kind of work trip, and they leave Hildegard with her relatives and who don't speak English and they come back and she's just speaking German. And he's like, it's, it's this miracle, you know? Um, Cause you know, ultimately the yeah. way you, you, you teach a language is you, you immerse. immerse. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm like, Oh man, it's like, he can go to Hitler's Germany. You're like, surely I can go to Putin's Russia. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, but, well, but maybe not because I mean we were we were going to go this summer. We got visas, and then the invasion happened, and I we're not going to go. Right. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so so I mean that for me that was the first essay I wrote, and um, you know it was pretty specific. Uh, <laughs> very, and, you know, yeah. it's like a very specific situation. Although after I published it, I got all these emails from all you know all sorts of people who were in all these interesting linguistic situations. You know, like they yeah. were. Um, a German speaker who lives in Sweden, um, but actually he's from Turkey. But he's <laughs> talking German to his daughter in Sweden. I, anyway, it, just, it was fascinating, and um, but it made me it made me think of you're like okay, you 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 make these decisions about what you're going to pursue with your kid, but they have these kind of like consequences. Yeah, these ripples. The yeah, and um, you know, and and. Uh, it's interesting to think about them and, and yeah, for sure they will they will have you know and so now Rafi and Ilya both like they I still speak Russian to them um they still answer in English but Rafi's comprehension um is like he knows a lot of Russian you know yeah. he understands Russian um so that's pretty cool like and you know I, I hope I hope Russia changes for sure um and it has changed in the past and when it does I hope we can go there so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, one of the anecdotes I uh, I really enjoyed from the book was just, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, it sounds like part of the reason you started speaking, uh, you know, uh, you, you spoke, you know, there's obviously a conscious decision, you want them to have this connection, but also it's a it's a language that's surprisingly rich in endearments. And yeah, so that yeah. I, I found that to be very, and you kind of yeah, go through. Yeah, it's very, I yeah. mean, you know, and, and I'm sure it was just, it was the language that, that I was spoken to as a kid. And yeah, um, yeah I kind of like found I had this, um, you know, kind of storehouse of, of little endearments for, for, for Rafi as he, yeah. you know, as he was growing up and um, when he was very little and it just seemed very natural to me. Um, so that was a really nice, that was kind of the nice part about, um speaking russian to him well, reading that made me uh i reached out to a uh, you know my uh my grandma came didn't come here from greece her parents came here from greece um uh, but she was in a greek speaking uh, household and uh tried to get us to speak more and there was a term of endearment that i i knew i could say i could repeat it but i didn't know how it was spelled so i reached out to on reddit to this uh greek speaking community and I was like, hey, I don't know what this word is. And turns out it, it basically meant like dummy. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like a, but they're like, no, no, no. It's like a cute, it, like grandmas do say it. it's like, hey, come here, dummy. You know, like, it's like it's, it's a cute thing. Like uh, like how like in some uh, Latin or Spanish cultures, like uh, gordo is kind of like a term of endearment. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. might, might literally translate to like fat. So um, the other thing I found interesting in the, in the even when you're talking about that was how the studies about uh, you know being bilingual have changed over time. Where at once it was looked at as a detriment, and then it was no, 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 no. It's uh, you know they test better, and then it was switched back again, and that study was debunked. Um, they, uh, just again, as someone who uh, you know my father-in-law speaks Spanish, my uh, my mother-in-law is bilingual, um, and we, me and my wife, have talked about it, and she laments that her parents didn't teach her Spanish. Um, and now, you know, it's like, we would love for our kids. And that's one of the things when we're looking at daycares or schools that we find, uh, appealing, right. If they are bilingual, they do teach them. That's something what, you know, we, we like. Yeah. yeah so I, I mean, all, all that was just really fascinating to me. And I just, again, found it relatable and informative. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, one of the things, um, sometimes you see, this is actually, a, this is in that, um, bringing up baby, which is a, a book about French parenting, which is a, you know, a really ex extremely well done book. Um, but it does this thing that a lot of kind of journalistic writing about um, 
parenting will do, which is it kind of it cites the so-called research. It says, well, the research support what the French do with their kids in, in you know, by giving them cheese early on or something like that. Um, and 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 what you learn actually once you kind of look into this, into any just about any aspect of um, child rearing research is there is always counter research, <laughs> you know, and, and yep. there's like almost no settled, uh, there are very few things um, that are settled where the research says one particular thing. There is, you know, any, any you look up a study and it's like, we have shown, yeah, that bilingualism is good for you. And then 10 years later, somebody comes along and they're like, that study was bullshit that was a flawed study design (laughs) uh i I tried to reproduce it with this different population it's not true you know and um you know i i I say in the book i think sleep actually sleep training is one of the few things that has a kind of evidentiary basis in the sense of like you know um it has you know it works (laughs) kids kids sleep better um by the age of six there's no uh um, noticeable De- detriment detriment in terms of their attachment to their parents right, right? um and the only and the, the parents only, sleep better they're happier and, the, and the, yes the, the one the one thing that you know and like they, they, it's hard to measure like infant uh happiness right but, right, right. but maternal happiness can be measured <laughs> and it improves noticeably because mom sleeps better um when the kid is sleep trained and was that the book was that the book where you had talked about uh you would realize you did, you had done everything wrong and you were just thrilled. <laughs> no, that was with uh, discipline, I think. Oh, discipline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely did everything wrong with, with the sleep training. I think we tried to like do a compromise, <laughs> which, yeah. is, which is the worst of both worlds. You know, we're like somewhere right. in, maybe somewhere in between zero sleep training and sleep training. <laughs> and actually somewhere in between it equals zero sleep training. Um, but, uh, you know, e- so even though that's actually like, uh, you know, it's kind of settled like that it works. Right. It's still controversial. There's still people who will say you shouldn't do this because, you know, other cultures don't do it. It's cruel. Like just even if even if science says it works, it's still cruel. You know, and so like right. there are people who, who don't who think you shouldn't do sleep training. And yeah. um, yeah, so there's a kind of like no settled answer to any question. Right. And that is uh, to me, that was kind of liberating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay. Bilingual and bilingualism is a good example. That it's something that everybody thinks is good for your neural pathways. That has really not been um, confirmed nor denied. Yeah, I, I mean, there there was a study that that said it was, and then there was one a few years later that was like, nah, I don't think so. And um, you know, maybe it is, but it, 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 what it does is it kind of puts it back in in your court as a parent. Right. You know, yeah. you're like, okay, I'm not going to do this because I think it's good for the neural pathways. I'm going to do this because I want to for, for right. whatever reason i want my kid to learn russian i want yeah. you know spanish i think is you know spanish is actually useful i would love i mean for like sure. i would have all these <laughs> i wouldn't have all these qualms about spanish like that's that's amazing right right if you can so much so many people in this country speak spanish that would be fantastic yeah. russian is a lot less useful yeah. well and, and you talk about uh, as you start to as you start to teach rafi russian um, and he starts, and you start to realize he understands it. It also mm-hmm. opens this door. Uh, you know, now you guys have a secret language, but it also mm-hmm. allows you to kind of uh, maybe uh, yell at him a little bit in public, <laughs> you know, with, like in places you normally wouldn't, right? Yeah, I mean that's something that he points out. <laughs> right, he points it out yes. again. The yeah. astute observation says, of children. Yes, yes, one of his astute observations. He said, "Yes, that's uh, this is kind of at the end of the book." He's like, "If, if." Uh, if people that understand what you were saying, they would think you weren't being very nice. Um, <laughs> which, you know, like all I was saying was like, st- stop hating your brother. Or right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't any. I, um, <clears throat> but yeah, a little. You know, sometimes. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it does it does give you a little bit of uh, wiggle room. Like I, I, I don't I don't think I say anything to Rafi that's like out of bounds that I would want other people to hear. But like, well, I don't know, maybe I do. Um, it does, you know, it is a, it is a kind of, um, you know, I mean, on the other hand, you know, something that, something we haven't talked about, but, but I think it's true. It's like, you know, I, I I mean, the premise of the book, just to kind of step back a little bit, Mm -hmm. the premise of the book is, and I think this is also the premise of your podcast is that, 
um, we are this kind of generation and, I, and I, you know, I'm older than you, but like our kids are close in age. Like it's, it's by generation, it's kind of more when our kids were born. Right. Yeah. Then, then how old we are. But, um, but it, it has something to do with how old we are too. Um, that, uh, like for, for a lot of reasons, you know, the workplace has changed, right. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, the nature of work where we work from home has changed, mm-hmm. right. Cultural expectations have changed. We're okay. just doing and gender just roles. Gender. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so we are doing, um, like dads are expected and are doing more parenting yeah. than our dads, right? And I don't know what your household is like, but like, you know, I describe, <laughs> I describe in, in, the, in the beginning of the book, I described having this conversation with my dad, who, you know, I think was a very involved dad, took me to right. all the sports games and everything, um, was very interested in what I was doing. But I was, I, um, I had interviewed my second grade teacher for one of the one of the chapters, I, I had this wonderful second grade teacher and during the pandemic, I, I had this like crisis about Rafi's education. I really wanted to talk to her. And, and then I had that conversation with her and then I talked to my dad a few days later and I was like, guess who I talked to? <laughs> Ms. Lynch. And he's like, who? And I'm like, my second grade teacher, Ms. Lynch. And he's like, oh, I don't know who that is. And I was like, well, you, you must have met her you know, at, at, a, at a parent-teacher conference. And he just laughed. He's like, no, I, I was at work. And I was like, you know, because my dad would like, you know, he would get up in the morning, he would go to work and he would come home in the evening and that was his life. And, yeah. um, and he, and he was a computer programmer. He wasn't like, he work at a factory. Construction, but like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was a very rigid job and just like the, but even more so like the idea of attending a parent teacher conference to him was just funny. <laughs> it was like a foreign, yeah, a foreign concept. He's like, why would I do that? You know, like yeah. that your mother did that. And yeah. to, whereas to me, and I don't know, I'm sure it sounds like it's the same for you. Like for sure. That's a, a major event, right? Yeah. yeah. Talking to your kid's teacher <laughs> and being like, what's he like? Like, what's he do? Who's he oh, friends yeah. with? Right. For sure. Um, I wouldn't miss that. Yeah. You'd be crazy. You wouldn't <laughs> you couldn't get no. me to miss that, right? No, that's so, you get all the juice. Yes. <laughs> you like you live off that for months. You're like, for sure. she said this. Yeah. Why do you think he does that? Anyway, so so that really struck me. I was like, huh. And I hadn't really like I'm consciously like I certainly didn't start the book being like, I am a new dad, you know, right. I am a general this new generation of dads. But like after that conversation, I was like, ah, you know, yeah, my dad just didn't he didn't have this, like he didn't think about this stuff. He wasn't involved in this stuff in the same way. And then like looking around at my you know my dads that i know like we're all kind of like this like we're yeah. all involved um you're you are a level above <laughs> in the hierarchy of dads because you like are stay at home you're actually doing it you're staying yeah. at home right yeah that's yeah full time you know yeah. um that's like the next level to which yeah. you know i somewhat aspire but like you know i i much respect i, I give well, you much well, respect. well <laughs> you know don't don't give too much because we're actually working our way towards uh like getting away from that just because we've okay. had all this yeah. time with me um you know as and, and i think we've had just the, the perfect i mean we really lucked out because um you know as things are starting to open up now and yeah. people are feeling safer um it's at the point where i think you know, both of them need to go out of the nest a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. they're, we actually have them in a daycare two days a week now. It's been a, yeah. it, that's only been a couple of weeks, but uh, you know, it's been a struggle. And again, just, I was listening to your chapter, uh, you know, where you're talking about doddling and Rafi doddling and just <laughs> yeah. how, how that was one of the things that, you know, kind of produced anger in you, um, you know, and I'm listening to this as, you know, my, my oldest is, you know, just put on like a whole, I don't want to go to school. I don't like school. I don't, you know, he's very resistant. The drop off, he cries, you know, it's, and and, you know, the first drop off for me, um, I'll I'll probably have talked about this a little bit in the, um, in the intro, but um, you know, you kind of talk about your first day with Asia, who is the babysitter Mm, mm, and, you know, just going away for three hours and that being two hours of worry and one hour of work, (laughs) you know, (laughs) um, And, you know, for us, I mean, it was, you know, and, and also the other thing I relate to very much, uh, you know, not to get too off, not to jump around too much, but, uh, you know, while it's all occurring to me, I don't want to forget, um, you talk about this, you know, the battle before daycare, and then dropping them off, and then 
all day long you're thinking you know you're looking at pictures you're pining over the kid you, you, yeah, it's yeah. all the warm <laughs> gushy feelings and then all of a sudden they come back and you're thinking like oh like everything's going to be different and then they come back and you fall right back into your patterns yeah. which is something i'm relating to and finding you know uh myself yeah. doing but um, yeah, that first that first i mean that first drop off at daycare like whether it's whether they're tiny or, or older i mean um that's hard. <laughs> well, and Shep was Shep, my oldest, was in daycare before the uh, pandemic. Okay. Um, so but he came out in 18 months, and for the past three years, yeah. it's just been wow. the two, you know, it's been the two wow. of us. So that's intense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have to say I'm a big, big fan of daycare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Huge fan. I mean, it's yeah, it's a it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful yeah. for us. Yeah. I think it's and it's been good for them too. It really has been as as uh, even though the transitions have been tough. Yeah, I, mean, I actually I just want, I wanted to finish. Um, oh yeah, sorry. But, yeah, no, but I mean, you know, so like, yeah, they're the, the this kind of stay at home dads. That's like a super dad, right? But like, <laughs> um, but then there's kind of regular dad. I think of of our generation, which is not a stay at home dad, but like a dad who's just way more involved than our dads were. And and yeah, I hadn't I hadn't seen that described. You know, I really had like. And there's this kind of like, um, I talk about it at the beginning. You know, there's kind of like dumb dad. Actually, you know, and which I think there's these guys on on uh, Twitter who make these like dumb dad videos, which I think <laughs> they're actually very funny. I'll um, check it out. Yeah, uh, but like, you know, but and and so you know, much respect to the dumb dad guys, but like, um, but kind of you know, yeah, regular dad is doing his best, not as good a parent as his spouse, but like trying his yeah. best, you know, and like involved. Like that's, I guess that's where I put myself, and and I. I think that's a that's kind of a new phenomenon. Um, For sure, and, and I thought it was worth, yeah, I thought it was worth describing. Your wife, who's also a wonderful writer, uh, called you the Christopher Columbus of mommy blogging, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which I thought was a very wonderful tongue in cheek uh, way way to refer to this. She's very funny. Yes, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely true. It's like, um, I mean, I think. Uh, there wasn't, there's an aspect of this book where, you know, some things you, you, um, it's helpful to be ignorant <laughs> in certain, in certain, you know, in certain yeah. like creative endeavors, um, to, to not know everything that's out there because then you're like, oh, this has been done already. Yeah. Um, can be, can be kind of, no, um, ignorance certainly is bliss, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it can be debilitating, right? You're like, oh, I, why would I, launch on this so you know some I'd, I'd already kind of started writing these essays um you know when i started reading some you know there's just uh you know rachel cusk's book um a life's work on motherhood's really excellent um uh, was a book by megan stack which i had read actually before i started reading these called uh, women's work which is about um you know kind of having uh being a foreign correspondent and then quitting that job uh, basically to to write and take care of her kids um but also but, but remaining abroad in, in china uh india and i think singapore um and just the kind of ethics uh of you know hiring a full-time nanny so that you can you know get your writing done <laughs> she kind of explores that it's a really good book it's called uh, women's work by megan stack it's amazing um megan o'connell and now we we have everything i mean so anyway there's a ton of um, literature by women um, yeah. about these subjects that is fantastic and um, you know and some of it I didn't know about when I started writing uh, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of it that I still don't know about um, you know so so uh, there was a you know a bit of that aspect of like coming to this material really fresh <laughs> um, but, but also as I say like in the book you know I um, and and this is true uh, I you know I think it's true of a lot of men it's certainly true in my case like I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about this before I became no. a parent, you know, and my wife did. She really did. And like, she had, she had thought about it. She read about it. She was really well prepared. And for me, I was not. And, um, you know, and that's not a ref, like a, a positive reflection on my character by any means, right. but, but it's a, it's a fact. And I, and I don't think I'm the only dad who's like that. No, for sure. I mean, that's a, a, another part of the book I related to, and, and yeah. actually, want it made me want to ask you this question because uh, I, I was surprised. I think my wife was also surprised um, just by like my. I, I think we both thought I would be more connected during the pregnancy stage, you know. Mm -hmm. So when 
so when your wife was pregnant during the pregnancy stage, you guys hadn't uh, come up with the name Rafi, but you guys were calling the baby Yuri. So did you feel yeah. very connected to Yuri? Was that something or? <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, that's interesting that you say that. Yeah, I, I did not because it's, it's, it's so, it was so happening to Emily, right? And I was yeah. like, oh my God. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I, I was like, oh, you know, I, was, I tried to be nice and supportive, but it was just this thing that was happening inside of her and it was happening to her and it was not happening to me. And it was very abstract for me. It was re- I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, I think that was the period that we were most, um, I mean, I do think, I, I think once, I think it was once he was born, there's, there was also some element of that where they had such an intense bond mm-hmm. and she was breastfeeding and she was, you know, she was the one who could make whatever ailed him go away. Right. Um, and I was not. So like that, and as, you know, as time goes on, you know, still, you know, prefers his mother. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but like the kind of gap between us, you know, with every day, it's just Close, narrow, yeah. narrow. Yeah. But I think the period of the pregnancy was the most intense where it was like, she was in such discomfort. Um, you know, her body, you know, there was, she was literally growing, you know, Rathi inside of her body. Yeah. And I was doing nothing. Yeah, nothing. Organs Zero. are moving around and being pushed around. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. The thing is, it's like, to me, uh, uh, you know, I, it's like taking mushrooms or hallucinogenic where like, it can't be, no one can describe that to you. It's a personal experience. And it's like something I'll never be able to experience, you know, like yeah. the, the pregnancy aspect, uh, you know, it's like, I just will never have that. And as you know, a bystander, it was just, a, you know, I thought I would just be more of like the, Oh, let's feel, but I, you know, I don't know. It was, I, you know, we were both surprised by it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. I guess like, and you know, when, when we were, you know, I haven't seen, I, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't prepared like a, I don't have a fully formula thought about this, but it does strike me that some of these expectations where we're like, we're not going to be like our dads. We're going to be right. so much yes. more involved and we're going to be so much more connected. And there's like some things that eh, it's just not going to happen. And, yeah. and if we were, and if we were claiming that like we were also experiencing the pregnancy, we'd be lying. Right. It'd be, yeah. It'd be disgenuine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, I have seen guys do that and, I'm like, mm, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> you were pregnant to me, yeah. <laughs> you know, and 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 that's like, and I guess I would say, uh, let's, you know, let's let's think about the things that, yeah, that, that we can we can be better at as as dads, right? And then there's going to be things where we're just not going to be able to do them ever. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. Well, and it goes back to your, I, I think one of you know the. The main themes, or, or at least what I think should be one of the main takeaways, which is like you have to be the best parent that that you're like w- within yourself, right? Like you have to you have to have a self awareness of who you are and understand whether or not you're capable of certain things, um, and and kind of work from that understanding outwardly. Um, yeah, and, and I think I think that I mean I think you know one of the things that is um, confusing is that it's such a radical transformation. Right, especially like I was 40 when yeah. Rafi was born. So I like, I was pretty set in my ways. <laughs> and so, so this was a total revolution in my life, right? The pregnancy was not, I mean, that pregnancy, as I say in the book, practically nothing had changed for me. I was yeah. playing hockey, I was playing beer league hockey like <laughs> four nights a week, right. you know? And then uh, Rafi was born and that went down to zero, you know? Mm-hmm. And it has remained at zero basically, you know? I mean, I, I started playing again last winter but once like once a week right yeah. um, and my skills have really <laughs> deteriorated. Uh, so it's this so on the one hand it's it's this revolution and you're like i am living this completely different life but on the other hand and now i am not just a guy who sits around drinks coffee and like writes his articles or books i'm dad right yeah. i'm data uh but you're still you yeah you actually have not been radically transformed and you won't be like you can't expect that so that's yeah that's the that's confusing (laughs) and you guys uh i I was kind of surprised by this because you know as you start to read a book by someone and it's uh if you get the audio book it's also narrated by you so you Mm -hmm. get to hear the uh, the individual speaking you get this false sense of familiarity or you know uh Mm. closeness 
Um, so I was kind of surprised to learn, uh, but it was also another connection to us personally. We didn't have a home birth, but my mother-in-law had all four of her children at home and uh, likes mm. to brag about it very often. Um, yeah, good for her. Yeah. So how, uh, please explain to our audience, Ricky Lake's role in your decision to have a home birth. <laughs> <laughs> do people know, do people still know who Ricky Lake is? Uh, you know, I, I'm hoping some of the new dad audience, <laughs> but for those who don't, uh, she was a, a popular talk show host in the 90s, also the an 90s, actress. Yeah, our journey included this this movie that Ricky Lake had made about <laughs> how wonderful home birth was, um, and, but it was this like, you know, and, and she makes a really strong case in the movie about how terrible hospital birth is and how, you know, they have ceased, you know, they really kind of like all these interventions, you know, kind of eventually almost inevitably lead to a C-section mm -hmm. that you may not need. And the C-section rate is, it's like 30%. It's really crazy. Right. Um, and, you know, it should be, I don't know, 10%, 5%, I don't know. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, and and um, so she, that case is, is very strong in the movie. But then, um, you know, you're like, okay, they should stop doing that at hospitals. But then I don't draw the conclusion from that that everybody should give birth at home. Right. Right? It just doesn't. It just doesn't logically follow. Um, I well, doesn't something you. happen in the documentary where, uh, like, one of the people has to go into the hospital because yeah, there's the a director. The director. Yeah. So Ricky Lake is. So the, it's a documentary. So it's. It's you know. There's all these kind of information and and you know experts, but also Ricky Lake herself is pregnant, and at the end of the movie, she gives birth at home, and it's beautiful. But the director is also pregnant and the director has to transfer to the hospital um, and for a C-section. And uh, because uh, I think her baby is, is in breach position as I recall, um, which is, means it's turned the wrong way and there's kind of no way to, to, to turn the baby around. So you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta uh, do surgery. And, um, and in the movie, and like, you're like, oh uh, gosh, um, if, they couldn't do the C-section, she might have died and the baby might have died, you know? And uh, in the movie, you're, it's kind of, you know, <laughs> oh, she didn't get to have a, a, a home birth. And you're like, oh man, like that's that's not, to me, that's not the lesson of that situation. Yeah. The lesson is, oh, thank God she was able to go to the hospital, you know? Um, right, the baby's, the baby's healthy and what they were able to save. Yeah, and then and then we had this kind of amazing, to me, um, you know, we 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 then sort of interviewed some some uh, midwives, and one of them, the first one, she was very nice. But then at the end, she says, "You know, if something happens, something goes wrong." You know, and Emily's like, I don't know, three, four months pregnant, for five months pregnant. Um, we're, we're terrified. We don't know what we're doing. Right. We've never been through this before. And the midwife says, "If something goes wrong, will you remain advocates of home birth?" And it was just the craziest. I was like. If why like if our baby dies like are we like are we gonna I mean I don't and we were like that's yeah. what's important right now yeah yeah that doesn't seem like the main thing <laughs> um, yeah and it was just so it was just such a crazy thing to say and we were like whoa and um, and that really like I was like wow that this person has an ideological commitment to this thing and. I'm not sure I want to work with them, you know, on this on yeah. this thing that I've never done before. That's very dangerous and yeah. enormous red flag. Yeah, and right. and then the next midwives, and then we did like we went to a birthing center and we, you know, watched their spiel, and then we met the midwives that, that we ended up um, um, hiring, um, Karen and Martin, and they were just it was such a different experience. They were like. The first, they basically, they weren't like, oh, home birth is so wonderful, where we become advocates of home birth. They were like, here's all the things that can go wrong. Yeah. And, you know, t -t 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 one, two, three, four, five. And here's what we would do in that situation. We'd go to the hospital. In, in this other situation, we'd boil some water. You know, and they, yeah. they, they had some real, they had a plan for everything. And that was their spiel. And they were like, basically, from I, it was the reverse of what, yes. um, from that previous midwife. And to me, it sounded like they were saying, if you only care about this, because you have this like naive notion about home birth, we actually don't want to work with you, you know? Totally. And, and I was like, yes, like, please, you know? And, yes. and they were amazing. And, and, and both times, like we had some, you know, uh, some small hiccups, but like, it, it was, it was a great, I mean, it was really a great experience and I'm so happy that we did it. But, um, you know, if we'd had to go to the hospital, that would have been fine, you know, as long yeah. as, you know, in the end, like 
you just want to get the baby out. <laughs> it, it's very yeah. similar to the process of becoming a foster parent because the classes that you take to do that, it's mm -hmm. it's all, I mean, at the beginning, they're trying to scare you. They're, they're saying like, hey, if you can't do X, Y, Z, you should not be a foster parent, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it was crazy to see in those classes how quickly people were dropping out after those first mm. couple of weeks, because, you know, it's like, Hey, uh, do you think you could possibly hand a child that you've grown this connection to back over to someone that you know has sexually assaulted them? Can you do that? Mm. If you can't do that, you need to leave, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a, you know, we're, they're kind of saying, Hey, this, 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 these are the dangers. And if, if you are only concerned with a home birth, then we're probably not the right people to work with. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, I found that very illuminating. It was just like, I was kind of, you know, going through, it, it's not a, it's not a work of fiction, right? But there's parts where I found myself as like gripped as it was, as if it were, where, you know, I'm like, well, what's going to happen with the midwives? Like, are they going to go, is it gonna be, are they going to switch to hospital birth now? Or, or, or they're good. I, mean, I was so happy when you yeah. found the, the, you know, the midwives that you did. Um, the, the other thing I just want to touch on, uh, you know, so I think you hit it right with the, the most important chapter. The chapter that was most surprising to me was the picture book chapter. Uh -huh. um, and, uh -huh. and we don't we don't have to cover it. We don't have to talk about this a lot. But uh, you talk about all, all of Rafi's favorite books. And uh, you had done something I never considered, which is like exploring the lives of the authors of these books. And you found some pretty interesting information and was illuminating to some of the work that you were reading, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, I just... I, I, yeah, it had, it had not occurred to me either. And then I found this um, uh, this little dedication in one of the um, Eric Carle books, right? The yeah. Very Little Hungry Caterpillar, um, The Very Hungry, what's it called? The Very Hungry Caterpillar? Yeah. Very hungry. Yeah, um, it, that's it's not that one. It's another one. Anyway, but yeah, we, you know, um, Rafi loved these books when he was really little. And I, you know, so I'm reading it to him for the thousandth time. And I look and there's this dedication to Herr Krauss, who allowed me to watch, who allowed me to see or introduced me to modern art, even when it was forbidden. And I was like, what? Like, why is it forbidden? And like, yeah. why is he German? You know, and, <laughs> and then I and then I looked it up and it turns out Eric Carl was born in the US, but his parents were German emigres and they went back to Germany in the 1930s to Nazi <laughs> Germany. Um, just like a verbal like linguist. Called, a linguist. Yes, yeah. but the <laughs> linguist was like, I'm getting out of here. Okay? Yeah. Hildegard has learned German, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, but Eric Carl's parents stayed and um, they went through the whole war in Germany and, and his dad, uh, was was drafted. The army fought on the Eastern Front with the Soviets, which was like the most horrible front, and uh, was taken prisoner, um, was forced, uh, you know, uh, the Soviets kept the German POWs for a few years afterward to right. help make them rebuild uh, the Soviet Union. So... Um, reparations, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a form of reparations, yeah. And... Um, you know, you actually see these buildings in, in uh, Moscow, people would be like, oh yeah, that's built by German POWs. It's very well, <laughs> they did a really good job. They're very, <laughs> very conscientious. Um, and yeah, and, and as he, he described his dad coming back like a shell of himself as a broken man. And um, Eric Carr himself, he, he didn't fight in the war. He was too, he was too young, but he, he was a teenager by the end. And he was kind of conscripted into a, a like a labor battalion. He had to dig ditches, um, and and he was he was very traumatized by this, uh, obviously. And um, and that kind of explained. And I was like, you know, it explained two things. I kind of I I, I didn't I don't love Eric Carl. He's not my favorite. Like I think <laughs> the picture's really pretty, but like the like the 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 text is not that great. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and it's like very like it's a little cutesy. And I was like, oh. You know, he, because some, because like the interesting things about like the really great, you know, picture book authors is, you know, like Morris Sendak, <laughs> right? Um, I'm blanking on the name as usual, but the, the guy wrote Moon Man, um, um, Seuss to an extent, you know, Margaret Wise Brown is my favorite, Good Night Blue, <laughs> Runaway Bunny. I mean, there's kind of a, there's a kind of a darkness, so certainly Runaway Bunny, there's a kind of real, madness at the center of that book and yeah anyway so like so so where know, the wild the, things are i think is one you mentioned yeah oh yeah um you know that book is scary but also not but nice um <laughs> some of his other stuff like just flat out scary yeah. <laughs> uh outside over here you know, outside over there is a kind of where the uh, goblins kidnap a baby that's just a scary book um <laughs> but uh 
yeah so i was like oh and i so to me carl kind of was like a, a rung below um those authors and then i was like oh it's because he was like he didn't want to have this kind of darkness yeah. in his books because he kind of lived through this the trauma of war yeah. yeah and then so that kind of I was like, oh, that's so interesting. What about some of these other guys? Um, and, you know, it, it was the Russian, I mean, there used to be, there's this guy named Garnier Chukovsky, who's kind of the greatest Russian children's writer. He's kind of like Seuss. He's, he's similar to Seuss and um, a similar uh, generation, actually. Um, but he had a fascinating biography. He kept this amazing diary. Um, you know, he was, from the revolutionary period, you know, after 1917, the 1920s, 1930s, he lived a very long time. So his diary is this kind of amazing document of Soviet literary life. Um, there used to be a much, much longer section in that <laughs> essay about Chukovsky. I got it down to like a paragraph. Um, but yeah, I mean, they just, you know, some of them had really interesting lives. And then actually the one, um, for some reason, the one that really, um, kind of stuck in my craw was the story of Russell Hoban, who um, wrote the Francis books. Do you know those books? I don't, I, I think I yeah. read, I would think I was read them as, are they older books? They're older books. They're from the sixties. Yeah. yeah okay. They're not as, um, I mean, they're still in print and yeah. I just, they, they are some of my favorite books. Uh, uh, bedtime for Francis. It's about a girl who, you know, keeps delaying her bedtime. It's, it's amazing book. And I uh, think Brett, my parents read me that. Yeah. I, my wife's, parents had read her to them and then we got them too and yeah i mean they're, they're really in my in my top five um of books and uh and francis uh bread and jam for francis is this great book and and the, the notable thing is about the, the thing about those books is that um the parents are really involved and they're like really they have these kind of brilliant parenting solutions and it's you know and they're from the early 60s so they, right. they feel very like they feel kind of 1950s era family but like the idea like the a family that has like creative solutions for their kids problems like yeah you know francis only wants to eat, you know doesn't want to eat anything except bread and jam so they start giving her bread and jam for every meal and finally <laughs> finally she's like ah oh, i'm so I'll sick of bread and jam yeah i'm so sick of bread and jam <laughs> I, I she's crying she says i want spaghetti and meatballs and her mother mm -hmm. says I had no idea you like spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> and it's this triumphant, you know, we say that all the time when one of our kids finally agrees to eat something. We say, I had no idea. <laughs> um, you, you liked, you know, this bland rice that yeah. we made specially for you. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so, but, but, oh, but it, so it turned out Hoban, he had four children. Um, he, he collaborated with his wife on these Francis books. She was the illustrator, he was the writer. Um, they had this, wonderful marriage. And then he has a midlife crisis, has an affair, leaves her for another woman, abandons the family <laughs> and, uh, you know, stops writing uh, children's books, starts writing uh, grown up books. And I, I, I felt so betrayed by this, you know, <laughs> and other, other people who've read that, they're like, what are, what's your problem? Like, why are you like, he, let him live his life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was like, no, he wrote the Francis books. Yeah. Like he, he betrayed me. <laughs> yeah. He, I, I believed in him as this yeah. father who stayed with his family. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, yeah. I thought that was a, um, an interesting story about, you know, and it took me, it took me a while to get over the betrayal um, of, of uh, you know, uh, oh, by Russell Hoban, but, but uh, now I, I, I feel okay. About it. There was another anecdote. I don't think it was in the picture book portion, but you talk about a poem by Harms, the man who disappeared. Mm -hmm. And it was a, uh, um, I think you guys, it was basically saved in the posterity because it was put into a little song, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think the, the anecdote in your book is that it was like a, a heartwarming moment when Rafi starts singing it back, right? Yes, it's, that's in the Russian chapter, but it like, it, it was, yeah, it was his favorite. It's this, um, it's this poem that starts, Is Doma Vushu Chilevia. A man yeah. leaves his house with a walking stick and a sack and on he goes and on he goes he never does look back I think that's <laughs> um and he, and he disappears into the woods and and harms wrote this in 1937 um and actually so it was like i think he just and he was kind of this genius eccentric genius and he, he wasn't like trying to um, make a commentary on the purges but the purge the stalinist purges were happening right then and right. it was kind of hard to read as anything but 
you know, people were disappearing into the woods and yeah. they were disappearing and you never saw them again. And uh, this was a, a poem about a guy who disappears. You never see him again. And um, he stopped being published after that and um, and basically began to starve. Um, and, he, and he wrote this amazing poem about that. So it was like, to me, it was like this, you know, and, and, and yeah, and it's in this Alexander Galich song um, about Harms. Um, and Harms eventually was arrested and, and eventually starved to death um, in a Soviet prison um, during the war. And so it had this, like, it was this, like, poem with this, like, incredibly dark history. But you read it, and it's, like, this very charming little poem about a guy <laughs> who goes on a, on a walk. And Rafi loved it. And I would, and I would just kind of, it was just, I felt, you know, this kind of cognitive dissonance of, of being very charmed by this two-year-old and being delighted that he likes this Russian poem, but also being uh, aware of, of its history and, yeah, and, its and feeling, yeah, um, yeah, and just feeling like, oh my, oh my God, like, what if Rafi goes to Russia? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah. it, I, I related to it not not because of the content or the um, significance of the piece, but um, you know, there was a a yeah 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 song that I sang to both my boys uh, <laughs> turn into, and you know, I remember um, back when the the first time Shep you know, as we would go through lullabies, he would want me to sing that song and he would sing a little bit of it back, uh, the pride that welled up. And just recently, uh, <laughs> yeah. our youngest Solomon started doing the same thing where it's, you know, he's singing it back and it's like, you know what, he's he's singing the right tune. He's in melody, mm-hmm. right? And you're like, this very proud moment. You're like, oh, you're, 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 not only are you listening, but you like what I like. Um, yeah, you know, it's a very proud. Can, maybe you can take over the pod. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully someday, yeah, that would be that would be ideal. And yeah, well, and you're talking about the Francis books again. I wonder, uh, and I know in the book you talk about you know the screen time as being kind of a, a point of contention between you and your wife. Uh, you know, at one point, and uh, you know the, during the pandemic, especially when you guys might have had uh, Corona, being exposed to a lot of uh, wild crats, and you know, that's why I recognize some of those shows. Do you guys watch Bluey? Because that's what it, it kind of sounds like. Uh, the Francis books are very similar to Bluey. Oh, I no, I don't think we went through a. Oh, you got you got to check out Bluey. Okay, okay. <laughs> if, if you like creative parenting, uh, and you're just looking for a new show, just something, it's. In, and this is I, by no means a, a hot take or a unique take anymore. I will we'll say if you go back to one of the uh, episodes in uh, episode one of New Dad, I was very early on this show. I do want to, I kind of want to pat myself on the back for that. But it's, I think um, I'm, my kids consume a lot of children programming and I think it's the best out there. So okay. right. yeah, we'll for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to take up a, a lot more of your time. Tell everyone where they can get, uh raising Rafi, uh you know where you can find that oh uh you could find it at, at uh, i hope at your local bookstore mm-hmm. um Raffi, it's on audible R-A- that's what I, yes I, I found, yeah i did find it on audible so yep. go, you can get it there amazon i'm sure as well yep and uh or, or uh, bookshop.org or, or your or your local store or wherever does emily bo- books. does emily's books carry it emily books it does not no no those no. those books are only by women so okay well, then. um yeah the Christopher Columbus of mommy blogging. That's mommy. right. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you very much, Keith. Uh, I've, I've loved this conversation. Uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun for me, hopefully for you too. Um, yes. Everyone go out by raising Rafi. Um, I, again, I, I can't say enough about it. I've uh, really connected a lot with it. And uh, I think it's, you know, I, I don't want to say this because it sounds cliche, but you know, like for one of the first times reading a parenting book, I was, I found myself like, yet like yet somebody actually understands me you know for the first time um so you know even if if you if your wife gave you a little shit for being the christopher columbus of mobby blogging i i am thankful for it Uh, you've uh you've helped at least one dad out there for sure and i think uh you're probably going to be hearing from a lot of other dads that you helped here i hope so i I think so i think so and uh best of luck to rafi and uh you know um to his hot budding hockey career. <laughs> Let's hope. And, I'm, not giving up. I'm not giving up. You're not giving, not giving up. up. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Keith, so much. Uh, we will be back next week with a new guest and a new topic. Um, I want to, again, thank our Patreons. And if you are listening to this, uh, please give us a review, uh, a like if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, subscribe, and leave comments below. Uh, always helps. So thank you, Rob Cause. Take us away.